Welcome back guys, it is your boy Lozard of course. Thank you so much for all the great comments on the last video. I love that we got the Dark Magician deck, core and engines, just the conversation flowing and running, and it's really motivated me to make this next video, talking once again about more of the engines, some of the ones I missed, some of the ones that are more common that I don't really talk about, like IP and uh, Unicorn. I never talk about IP Masquerade and Unicorn, which sounds a bit silly because it's not really an engine, but you get what I mean, like now without Anaconda, stuff like that's more appropriate for our deck, especially because we have stuff like Eternal Soul, so getting into a Link 2 and then passing, being able to summon out Dark Magician with Eternal Soul, banish something with Circle, and then go on IP Unicorn Shuffle. Not a bad play for us nowadays, alright? Not a bad play for us. I know a lot of people played that stuff before, but I honestly just didn't think it was worth it, but now I'm reconsidering. Anyway, let's get right into it. So just like last time, I've kind of got the core as the first 30 cards. I know that's a lot for a core, but Ash isn't core, right? Village isn't necessarily core, but I do think they're very good to play, so I'm just going to slap them in there. Upstart's kind of a core card, and uh, I put DMG now in the main this time, uh, just because a lot of people do want to play her, and a lot of the support cards do want you to play her. I'm still on the fence about playing her, guys. I, I don't think it's that necessary. But for the sake of it being DM oriented core, let's just put her in. And if we need the room, she can get cut. Same with the copies of prep. We can cut down to two copies of prep. Same with circle, we can cut down to one. Salvation can honestly get cut as well. There's a lot of flex spots here. And don't forget that these spots are also very good when you need to side in hand traps. A lot of people want me to do a new siding video. I might soon. But just as a little kind of precursor for that, upstart, salvation, a copy of prep even like a second copy of circle even at this point like your third rod these are good cards to side out and you might be asking why well it's because we play so many consistency cards already it's actually kind of fine to cut these especially if you're siding them in for say let's say nibiru against like a hero deck i know that, that's a terrible example because it's not a meta deck but the, you get what i'm saying right if you know a hand trap or something in your side is super super relevant let's say you have six cards in your side that are super relevant in the matchup so straight away just upstart salvation and one prep that's that's three slots like freed up we could go beyond that but i'll i'll save the siding for another video let's talk about the first engine of today and it's one that i probably should have had in the last video if you haven't seen that video please go check it out because this is actually part two but anyway the ritual engine or the diviner slash manju engine now these cards by themselves are pretty good i want to say they're kind of better than rod at least they were definitely better than rod before when anaconda was legal now, not so much. What's interesting about playing the Diviner and the Manju engine is you can actually now search Magician of Chaos and Magician of Chaos Max. Now, of course, you can search Magician of Chaos off prep because it's a level 7, but Illusion of Chaos doesn't search Magician of Chaos or Magician of Black Chaos Max, which is really stupid to me. Like, they're Dark Magician monsters. Yes, they're rituals, but this is one of the best cards we've ever received, and yet it can't search some of our other broken rituals. Like... It's truly ironic. I'm not sure why. Konami really thought we were going to do something busted with uh, Magician of Black Chaos Max and Magician of Chaos. I suppose they were worried that our uh, Megaliths were going to turbo this out better than us now with Illusion of Chaos. But anyway, the point is, it's very cool that we have these awesome rituals. Same with our fusions. But once again, they're kind of stuck behind a gate. You know, they're being gate kept by our lack of good summoning cards, our lack of Red Eyes Fusion for Dark Magician, our lack of just consistency or resource management when it comes to summoning these old school fusion and ritual mechanics. I don't think it's news to anyone that fusion and ritual in 2022 are not good game mechanics, right? It's all about linking, even syncing to some degree because Halk still exists. But let's just look at fusion and ritual. There's no real decks playing them except, oh, look at Drytron. What does it do? It rituals from the graveyard. It can ritual through all these certain manipulations and a lot of good searches and starter, one card starters, you know. I know Drytron needs about two cards to get going, but it's got a lot of good one card starters or cards to bait hand traps. And let's look at a modern fusion deck. Well, we've got Branded, which would be a great one. But I also like to just refer to Invoked a lot because invoked is a perfect fusion engine in the sense that you make a fusion and you keep the same cards in hand you go neutral in card advantage and that's something fusion and rituals struggle to do right they really struggle to keep your hand nice and full while giving you actual good monsters and while our rituals and fusions are good one we don't have a good way to search them two we don't have good cards to summon them and it's just awkward if we can summon them we normally have to spend all of our hand to get there and by the time we do that in Dark Magician, the game is over. It either takes too many turns, too many resources, or the cards just lackluster. It's a combination of the three that make DM truly a miserable deck. A trashiest of trash decks. But alas, we are here to try and fix this problem. Otherwise, why are you watching the video, am I right? So, without further ado, let's take a look at what Manju and Diviner can provide for the deck. 
Alright, so let's look at the Diviner play. We've just got to upstart here because we do need to set a card uh, in this combo. But there's also a route you can go where you don't have to set a card, so we'll just have a look at both. So Diviner is going to send Herald here. Herald, of course, will let us add any ritual. So this could not only add Illusion of Chaos, this could add our Magician of Black Chaos Max. So if you wanted to go down a Max route, that's an option too. Obviously, uh, Max will be very hard to summon being level 8 and not being, like, uh, Diviner being your normal summon means you can't use Rod Search, which sucks, but you know, you, you get me. Uh, it's just something you'll be able to do. So what we're going to do here is uh, we'll put back the Illusion of Chaos because we do need to set a card later on. And we'd like to summon slash Mill Dark Magician normally because we don't have Anaconda anymore. But what we're actually going to do uh, anyway is summon DMG, and that's because she's a level 6, and you'll notice Divine is a level 6 because we sent Herald, which is a level 4. So we can actually go into Beatrice, which we might do after. Uh, but for now, we're going to make to Zulkan, because this means, of course, we can go and set this upstart, and fantastic, we can get a Crystal Wing out. Now, is that that worth it for two cards? Not necessarily is that really worth it, but if you do have that extra extender from here, let's see if we draw it. I don't think we will. I think we're going to draw a Dark Magician. Oh yeah, the Illusion of Chaos we stacked, of course. <laughs> if you do have a extender from here, you can go ahead and link to Zulkan with your extender. I don't know what that extender would be, but you could link it into IP Masquerina, right? That would be a pretty nice end board. Three card end board, but you know, we're spitballing here. It's okay. Alright, so the other use of Diviner, I'm sure you saw it before, but we'll just go through the steps in case anyone hasn't done it before or something like that. We're going to go ahead and send Herald, Herald Effect will activate, and then we will go and grab Illusion of Chaos. Once again, you can add any ritual, so feel free to tech in some weird shit here. Chaos Max is always a cool card, because we can't really search it. The fact that Illusion of Chaos won't search it is really stupid, I hate it. It just felt like an unnecessary thing that they did. We'll put the Manju back here, because it's, it's not his time to shine, we're not looking at him yet. So once again, we do have to play the DMG for the Diviner play to work. Another reason why I'm not the biggest fan of the Diviner play anymore. Um, but anyway, two level sixes, of course, means we can make Beatrice. And this is where it gets weird, because Beatrice is obviously very good. I'm not denying that. Beatrice is amazing. We get to send a card from deck to grave. Always send the DMG, right? Because you want to put the bricks in the bin. So this is good. If you had, like, Eternal Soul in hand, great. You could send your Dark Magician here. Like, you can even send Rod if you just need to add Rod back next turn, right? If you already have Eternal Soul DM and all that jazz, you can send Rod. But I feel like sending Soul Servant is going to be the other thing you send. Some people mentioned sending Navi. I don't think you're going to have the setup for Navi to be relevant. I think it's just Soul Servant, DM, or Rod. And it's probably going to be DM or Soul Servant a lot of the time. I'm just going to go for the draw one here and draw that Manju we stacked. But you can see that this is, like, a one one card, two card combo. Oh, sorry, no, it is a one card combo that then replaces itself. Because you Soul Servant draw, fantastic. Now, you'll notice I can pass turn. On the opponent's turn, I'm actually able to use Beatrice again. So let's go ahead and activate Beatrice. She'll now have no material, which is absolutely fine. And that means we can now send our Dark Magician, for example, if we had the Eternal Soul set up. So I don't mind Divine. I know I just said it's not that great. It's okay, right? It's okay. For a one-card engine, it's pretty cute. It does require you to play some Heralds and stuff in your extra deck. But it's not bad. It's very prone to hand traps, of course. But hey, what, what combo is not going to be prone to hand traps? Anyway, let's hit that reset. And we're going to look at Manju now. This is the budget option for Diviner. And let me just say, it's not that much worse, all right? Comparing our Diviner, which is probably like a $60 card for Australia at least. I'd say around that, maybe 50. Um, Manju's like 50 cents, so <laughs> do not be afraid to just play this instead, okay? This just kind of skips a step. So instead of having to send Herald, that's another good thing. You don't have to play the Herald spot. You're just going to add a ritual. So you can add, once again, the Chaos Max or uh, Magician of Chaos, uh, the, the new one. I think I'm saying the right one. Or then Illusion of Chaos, of course. Here's kind of the weird part. We don't really have a lot to do now because we don't have Anaconda. So yeah, we've searched our ritual. We've got our Magician Souls. We've got our DM in the bin. I think at this point, you just special summon the um, the Magician Souls. and There's not a lot else to do, but you gotta pray you got Eternal Soul or something and just make IP pass. Like, not, not a lot else to do there, but they're nice options if you wanted to play a ritual-based Dark Magician build, right? Oh, you're back. Yes. Unfortunately, they don't do too much. They do rely on the rest of your hand being a little bit good. I do like that Diviner going into Herald is essentially a one-card combo that then gives you back that card because Soul Servant can give you a draw, right? I like that because you have five cards in your hand and you have a Beatrice sitting on your field waiting to send on the opponent's turn. So hopefully, within that five-card hand, you've got a way to Circle or a way to Eternal Soul or at least the Eternal Soul 
so that then Beatrice on the opponent's turn can send Dark Magician to the grave, and there you go, voila, you're ready. So Beatrice is a very nice addition to trying to achieve the Dark Magician triangle, or just milling bricks, or even getting Rod in the grave. Don't forget that Rod has a very nice uh, effect in the grave, and sometimes milling Rod is a pretty nice effect. I can't think of too much else we can do with our Ritual Engine. But if I do think of anything, I'll definitely let you know. And if I missed anything, let me know down in the comments right away. Now, I did think you guys probably want to see how Diviner can beat the entire Flunder matchup with uh, basically just a normal summon. So let's go ahead and do that, shall we? Now, of course, we're playing into every hand trap under the sun to get there. But that doesn't really matter when we're looking at a deck like Dark Magician. We're going to get hand trapped and lose anyway. So we may as well try and do something freaking cool. So, we're going to go down the typical route of Diviner, which is adding Illusion of Chaos and then doing Magician Souls things. Let's put back that card that we uh, didn't search, because that would be weird. Uh, we're going to, once again, send Dark Magician Girl. All the cool combos are with Dark Magician Girl with Diviner. It's really annoying. I wish it wasn't with her and it was just with DM. But unfortunately, with DM, we can't summon shit. But I think you see what we do. We just summon Final Sugma Nuts Pass. What does the opponent do? Tell me. What does Flunder do? Flunder Scoop. None of Flunder's guards affect this boy. <laughs> so, this is a nifty tech to keep in your side deck or your back pocket. If you've got a lot of Flunder players at locals, guess what? This will beat the entire archetype. Flunder players have been riding in for so long to Judge's Lounge, trying to find ways around this card. There isn't. They lose. Take the free win and move on, gentlemen. We've at least got one matchup in the bag. I just spilt tea everywhere. Fuck. Well, besides me running out of tissues and my desk smelling of tea, I'm actually feeling quite good now. I think the Ritual Engine is very cute. I don't mind it at all, but I don't really think it's what I play going forward. But it's an option I thought I'd bring up, and hey, maybe one format, I'll really like it. But on to the next engine. Okay, this next engine is a bit of a mixed bag here. So let's start off with uh, Red Eyes Black Media Dragon. One of the new cards coming out. It was a jump promo, but it's also just going to be given to us some other way, I hope, in future. Uh, we've also got Chronicle Magician, which was given to us very recently. I need to pick up a copy of this still, so if any one of my locals has one, send it my way. <laughs> we've got the Shooter here, who's always been a very nice boy when we want to make rank 7s. And we've got Apprentice here, which will help us make our Naruto down here. So anyway, back to Red Eyes. So the weird thing about this Red Eyes is, it can summon itself for free, kind of like Magician Souls, by sending a Vanilla from Deck to Grave. Now we were playing normal Red Eyes before with Ref, and you probably are still going to want to play at least one Ref, and you'll see why in a sec. Uh, so normally the Media Dragon is going to send your Dark Magician from Deck to Grave to summon itself for free. And then what you're going to want to do is use your Magician Souls to send Dark Magician Girl. But you're going to use a Magician Souls effect to summon Dark Magician from the Grave. So now you've got Media Dragon and DM on field. And you've got the DM Girl in Grave as well, so that's really nice. And from there you can just uh, overlay them into any of our Rank 7s here. But none of them are that good for going first, and we'll, we'll get to that in a bit too. Solid Rank 7 card for the deck, and its additional effect of during the main phase except the turn the card sent to the Grave, banish this card from Grave, add a Red Eyes Fusion from deck or Grave to hand. So, pretty nice effect. I wish you could do it the turn it was sent. And a lot of people might be like, why? Well, we could play like Foolish Burial, we could do some other combo that mills a card, or just the fact that you get a free card's always good. Like a lot of people might be like, oh, we can't use the Red Eyes Fusion. Yeah, but you can set it with Magician Souls. Like we could do so much with a free card, especially a spell. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like the free card would have been really nice, but unfortunately it's the turn after. But anyway, cool card. If you do play, you might want to play Vanilla Red Eyes and Red Eyes Fusion as well, but I'm just going to cut the uh, Vanilla Red Eyes for now. And you might even want to play three Dark Magician if you do play uh, this way. So maybe we will bump up that Dark Magician just to three. I'm just going to put it down here to go with this. Um, just because you're going to need those targets, like Souls is going to want to send DMG or DM, and Media is going to want to send the DM, so you probably would play three. And yeah, I know that's crazy. I, I don't normally uh, advertise playing 3D. But here I am, I I'm saying it. Uh, but this is kind of the only reason to do it, in my opinion. A card as strong as this. And even in saying that, this card's not that strong. You get what I'm saying, right? So, yeah, the shooter is interesting because the shooter just requires you to control no effect monsters. And then you can just summon it out for free. So, luckily, you can combo that with Magician Soul Summoning Dark Magician, for example. Or you can just summon the shooter first, right? That's the simplest task here. Summon the shooter first and then do your other summons. It's great. Now, the reason why the shooter 
shooter's really nice too. Like, it's a dark as well, and it's a level 7, so you'll notice the theme. Now, this card's actually a level 6, which a lot of people are confused by, but when it hits the field, it becomes a level 7. So, yeah, don't, don't fret. It actually is a level 7, just while it's on the field. It gets its extra level by just summoning itself. I, I'm not really sure. It just, it just does. It's part of the combo to summon it, so really good and the reason it's level six is to work with the media dragon stuff in the red eyes deck so this is the best level six target for them to play now because all the other media dragons are terrible so this is some people are confused by that that's why this is level six so in the deck it's a level six for ref but yeah you really do just want this card in this deck to be a level seven and that's what it does when it's on the field so fantastic but anyway uh back to the shooter so why the shooter is so hot is when you do make an xz with the shooter you can then banish the the shooter or you normally want to say go into ebon illusion magician and then detach the the shooter to use the effect to summon out an extra DM from deck. And then from there, you can actually banish the Vishuda because you now control a normal monster, right? You control Dark Magician because you summon off Ebon effect. Congratulations, now Vishuda can banish and bounce a card back to hand. So you're getting the removal from a potential circle if you have circle up, the removal from the shooter, and then Ebon in the battle phase when you swing with that normal vanilla Dark Magician, you get another banish. So that's like three interruptions off two to three cards. It, it depends. But for DM, it's pretty nice, I want to say. It's it's not bad at all. And if you're playing this many darks, and Chronicles Dark, and Apprentice's Dark, you see where I'm going? Allure of Darkness can now come into this. So let's just go on ahead and add Allure in. I know this list is getting very big down the bottom here, and I'll try to... Let's just cut that DM back again so we can just see everything still. Uh, let's move the Apprentice and stuff up just because they're kind of more DM cards and these are kind of not so much DM cards, are they? Uh, but they do work very well. So we've got 21 Dark targets all up for Allure of Darkness, so that's pretty good odds. And it just means you won't open too many of the same one, if that makes sense. Because obviously multiple Meteors is bad, multiple 10 years bad. Like you could go like 2 and 2. But I think what's correct is to just Allure of Darkness away the extra copies, right? And I think that will work just fine. Now let's speak quickly about these Dark Magician-ish cards before we get into the big bad Xyz. So, Apprentice is necessary in an Xyz build. Uh, one, because it's not it's not a bad card at all. I think playing it at one is actually fine in a pure DM build. Like, it's not a bad card to play, right? Especially if you're playing 3DM, like playing Apprentice becomes even more relevant. So, there's also that aspect, right? But what's really cool about Apprentice here is she's a level six and Magician Souls will summon out DMG, who's also a level six, which means you can go into Naruto, which is a turn one Xyz. And we're going to talk about all the other Xyz in a second. And you'll notice none of them are turn one Xyz. They're really bad going first. And look, Naruto is not that great too. It's just an opponent's spell trap. You can detach, negate, and if you do destroy. It's not the best. It's not the worst. It's just kind of there. The main reason I have it here, though, isn't for that going first effect, actually. It's because it can rank up into Ebon Illusion Magician, which means going second's very good because Apprentice plus Magician Souls is a three-card combo because you do need to discard for Apprentice. It kind of sucks, but you got to do it. So you do need a discard for Apprentice to go into Naruto, to go into Ebon for free, Ebon go into battle phase, beat something up, and then just go into Zeus. That's probably the best going second Dark Magician XYZ play. But let's talk about some of the other ones too. Now, on your way up, you go Naruto into Ebon and actually detach and summon out the Dark Magician. Let's say you had Circle up. That would be a good play to do as well, right? But if you don't have Circle or if you haven't established a board yet, well, you're going to want to just go to battle phase, hit with Ebon, and then go into Zeus. And of course, Ebon Illusion Magician can just be made with two level sevens anyway. So it's just a really flexible card here, especially with Naruto. Like, it has so many uses, and it's probably the best, most generic rank 7 we have. Like, it's still trash going first. Like, unless you're setting up with Village or something, like... But even then, just leave your Dark Magician and, like, your Vashooter out or something like that, right? I don't know. Seems weird. But anyway, the point is, this is probably the staple XYZ, which I don't think anyone will be shocked to hear. It's a Spellcaster that's literally a Dark Magician in XE form. I really do hope we get a Link form at some point, or a Link form of Tomayos or something, so we need a Link. But anyway, next Spellcaster uh, XE that I really dig is Big Eye. Unlike what uh, Team Sam may say, you cannot go into Zeus after stealing uh, with... Big Eye, because Big Eye can't attack the turn you use its effect. Though Big Eye is still very good, because stealing opponent's cards is generally very good. Especially if you happen to see Change of Heart as well, you can go ahead and just take half their board. That's pretty nice. Big Eye does suffer from the fact that he cannot attack the turn he steals, and he also kind of doesn't do much past stealing the card. 
Though, if you were to steal something pretty good, you are probably in good hands. Yeah, I don't know. Big Eye is kind of just a solid going second option. You do put a lot of resources into it, hoping it pays off. And if it doesn't, well, yikes. But uh, whatever. It's a pretty good card. Flare Metal. Flare Metal's mainly here to finish a game. So if you end up going into battle phase and hitting them with like two Dark Magicians or something like that, you're going to want to go to main phase two and just rank straight into this and pass from there. The sad thing about this is if you do happen to get your two or three, depending on how many you play, but if you happen to get the only Dark Magicians, magicians you have in rotation under flare metal then you can't eternal soul anything out and trigger your circle stuff or like you know maintain your village it feels really bad so just be wary of when you go into flare metal you cannot detach all the other Xyz, you can detach like for free, right? Draco Sack, detach, spawn some tokens. Ebon Illusion, detach, summon a DM from hand or deck. Norito has to negate something, but it's rank six, so it doesn't matter. Big Eye, you just gotta steal something, but you can detach. Fantastic. We'll get to Mind Hacker, but once again, you can detach and at least get one of the bricks in the grave, right? One of the DMs in the grave. I do find Flare Metal can conflict with the deck sometimes, because sometimes you get something stuck under there that you want back. And yes, it can detach a material to summon a normal Red Eyes monster from Grave. Unless you're playing vanilla Red Eyes, that effect won't come up. But there's a possibility that you are, since this card can search Ref, and Ref isn't bad. So I may make a build that does like Ref and Rank 7 stuff, but that might be a bit of a mess. But it's at least got some sort of synergy, thanks to Media Dragon. But I'd have to test that a lot. But anyway, on to the next XE. Now, Draco Sack's interesting because it spawns two tokens. And as we know, spawning tokens is very good. And if this card ever comes back, Galaxy Tomahawk will definitely play it. For those who don't know, Galaxy Tomahawk got very, very much banned because it detaches two materials and special summons as many tokens as you like. So you put it in the extra monster zone, detach, and just spam your field with tokens. Your opponent doesn't take damage for the turn, but you have six bodies to play with, so there are a lot of Link stuff goes on from there. And our deck can actually benefit from that, making like Nightmare Griffin into like a big board of Links and Jazz and like co-linking all the Nightmares and stuff. We could actually make a board that is very annoying for the opponent to play through, but unfortunately uh, this card got very much banned and it's probably for the best, let's be real. But yeah, if it ever comes back, you're definitely slipping it back in the DM deck. Tomahawk's amazing. So Draco Sack's pretty much a budget version of Tomahawk, that's why I brought it up. And I guess... What's cool about Draco Sack is it has two uses once again. You can detach a material and spawn the tokens. Those tokens you can, of course, turn into Link Spider, who I ironically don't have in here. All right, I've brought Link Spider back in in place of I'm Duck. It doesn't matter too much. But yeah, it just means you can turn your token into a Link Spider, and then from there, like Draco Sack and Link Spider can become something bigger. And you could possibly do some sort of Link Climbing then. But that depends on the links you're playing. With the links right here, you couldn't really do much. But you get what I'm saying. There's the possibility of going bigger. And the tokens are wind. So maybe you would even play the wind charmer. I don't know. There's, there's probably good targets in the bin to take, like Fleur and whatnot. Anyway, that's not too important. What is cool, Dragozak lets you tribute a token and target a card in the field and destroy it. Once again, Dragozak can't attack the turn you do that. So that kind of sucks. But what I do like about this card is it makes two cards into one and then into three. So I like that it makes your board a lot wider. You could say it's not that useful. It's okay. I thought it deserved a mention. But you know what? It's probably not the best idea to play it. But anyway, it's a thing you can do. Alright, we get to Zeus. If you're playing XYZs, you got to play Zeus. So Zeus is going to be here. Because it's literally the most stupid card. It's that one in the OCG and it probably should be over here too. I know no one's really abusing it, but it's just that kind of card. It's very degenerate. But yeah, you got to play Zeus. At least one. You could get away with two, but one should be just fine. And as I said, you can get a double material Zeus if you do the Ebon Illusion Norito rank up. So you should have DMG under there, Apprentice under there, Norito, Ebon, and then Zeus on top. That should be four materials. You do love to see it. All right, I thought I'd put a going first rank seven in here because there just isn't any good going first rank sevens. Change my mind. Let me know in the comments if there is one. I don't think there is. So this one is the Mind Hacker. A lot of people overhyped this garbage, unfortunately. Because it was a prize card, I feel it got overhyped and it doesn't do anything. You look at their deck, their extra deck, and you banish something face down. And then it triggers its second effect because you banished one of their cards face down. You can then banish cards from the top of their deck face down equal to their number of face down banished cards. So that should just be one. Banish something from their extra deck and you banish the top card of the deck and you pray that it's relevant. Like this could completely stop a combo deck if you had desk pot 01 from the top of their deck, or if you take out uh, Halka or Aurorodon from their extra deck, for example. But you know, Aurorodon's banned now, so don't have to worry about that. But you get what I'm saying. It can be a good card, but I feel like any extra deck monster your opponent has in their extra deck that is important, they will have two to three copies of. So ask yourself, is putting two level sevens into this worth it when it has no protection it doesn't really offer anything aside from being a 2800 attack monster it doesn't really do a lot unless your opponent's played two pot of desires 
This card's not quite going to mill them out, is it? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it doesn't really help the DM strategy in any way. It's just something to do going first, but I disagree with it. I just think you don't play it, right? You just don't. Because DM's a good deck for playing first. And the XEs are all good going second. So that kind of contradicts itself there. But you could at least make the argument, well, going first, I'll just do normal Dark Magician stuff, like Normaling Rod, uh, Magician Souls, just get DM in rotation with Circle, Eternal Soul, blah, 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 blah. Sure. But then, like, you're still going to open some of the Rank 7 cards and you're going first hand and be like, what the fuck do I do with these? And you're not going to know. But that's what I'm saying. Hopefully, we could get a Rank 7 that helps us go first. But getting an XE and the current year. It doesn't really seem that viable, but hey, maybe we'll work something out. I'm going to do a bunch of honorable mentions now because I'm sure a lot of people will mention them in the comments if I don't. So one of them is the Spellbook uh, Rank 7. If you're playing the Spellbook engine, this could be good because it's detached material. Destroy uh, spell traps, your opponent controls up to Spellbook cards. Uh, spellbook spells, sorry, specifically in the grave. So it'll only be two. And the other thing is it's two level seven spellcasters. So probably wouldn't even bother with this, but I thought I'd mention it or someone else will. Uh, Odd Eyes Absolute. This was a pretty good rank seven to make back in like 215, 216. I might have my years a bit off, but you know, it definitely was one of those good Xyz to make back then because you could special summon Odd Eyes when it was actually destroyed, which was really nice because Vortex Dragon is a great card to go into. We can't use the negate on it, but it was still pretty cool. And uh, apart from that, it doesn't really do anything. It's just a 2800 dragon that floats, and that was the main reason to play it. You could say it's a going first XYZ, but it's really not. It's not that great. I think it uh, it has a negate on it, but I'm not sure if you have to do the special of an odd eyes. I forget. And even if you do, even if you don't, sorry, it's still not that great. So I don't know if I'd play it. So I thought I'd mention Dark Arm because we love Dark Armed here on the Loza channel, and you can actually summon it with the Media Dragon for just one material. Uh, if we had five monsters in graveyard, exactly five to be specific, we can actually just use a level five or higher Dark Dragon as material. So that could be the Red Eyes Media Dragon. In that case, it's really good. And the Dark Arm Media Dragon effect is detached material. So that would be that Red Eyes, which then has the Red Eyes Fusion Search effect next turn. Not bad. Detach material, target one card, your opponent controls, destroy it, and then banish one card from their graveyard. Also, this card can't attack for the rest of the turn. That's where it's a bit of a yikes, because you do want to attack with this card. It's 2800 attack, and then you want to go into Zeus. So, I mean, in this case, you wouldn't, because you wouldn't have the material. So, you know what, maybe it's fine that it doesn't attack, it probably checks out. It is a bit unfortunate, because it's 28 attack for a 1 material, that would be really nice, just to have as a little tech. But I don't think it's worth it, uh, you can play it if you want, it's still 2 level 7s otherwise. But yeah, the fact that it can't attack after its effects, really annoying. Targeting a card and destroying it is pretty good, and it doesn't target for cost, as far as I can tell. Detach a material from this card, then target a card you're- Oh sorry, it does target for cost destroys it, and then the banished card, oh, from your graveyard. Oh, well, that's terrible. I just realized it's banished card from your graveyard. Well, that's just annoying. Okay, so you can't just keep using the effect. That's stupid. Ah, uh, this card sucks. I, I wouldn't even bother. Screw this card. I really like this card, harmonizing uh, Gradily. Gradily? I, I don't know how to say it, but it's a cool card because it's wielding a keytar as a weapon, like a synthesizer. I love that. Uh, as you know, I, I do like the uh, piano, so it's really cool. The card isn't that great. The cool thing is it can target a monster opponent's graveyard, attach a material from this card, and attach that graveyard card to this. So, like, in theory, you could, like, grab a DPE, right, and slip it onto here. That aspect of this card is cool and could warrant playing it, but I feel like there's just better ways to deal with DPE and like stuff in grave but i could be wrong and maybe this is a cool tech but yeah cool card overall anyway very cool art i should mention gaia mainly because well for one you can rank up from it from a level six or a level five xe meaning narito uh two it has piercing and it's 2600 which is 100 higher than ebon which isn't the biggest deal but the piercing can be relevant it can either help you not lose to crooked cook if anyone plays that it can help you kill someone in time if you just need to deal damage and they've summoned in defense it can also help you go into Zeus very easily if there's just a nice, easy attack to make kind of thing. So it's not the worst card, to be honest. I think just Narito and Ebon are kind of the Dark Magician versions of rank up stuff. Like, we don't really need it in this deck. If if Ebon didn't exist or didn't have the rank up ability where it can use a rank 6 spellcaster to go on top, I would probably be playing this, but it's fine. Ebon does. Uh, this is a new card, and when I saw it, I, I it screamed Dark Magician support. It's a dark, like, paladin-looking guy riding a dragon horse-looking thing. It's a dragon XZ with the exact same stats as Dark Magician. I was like, it's our new XZ. Like, they made us a new XZ. And then I read it, and I'm like, no, they didn't. 
So, uh, Volo Furnages. I, I, I'm not saying that right, but we're going with, uh, let's just go with Volo. Uh, Volo the Darkest Dragon Doom Rider. So once per turn, detach two materials from this card, then target a face-up card on the field, destroy it. Two materials for one, it seems not that worth it just from the get-go, but let's keep reading. Destroy it, I, if you do destroy a monster, you can make one face-up monster you control gain attack equal to the destroyer's monster's original level slash rank times 300 at the end of the next turn. This card can't attack. <sighs> Why does Konami think these rank 7s are like broken and they have to have restrictions? This card can't attack the turn you use the effect, so you can't give the attack to itself, it's pointless. This is a quick effect, this card has a dragon as material, but it can't be activated in the damage step. So, that aspect of it's nice. I mentioned we don't have good going first Xyz. This is probably the best of the going first Xyz. No cap, no cap, for real for real on god so mayhaps you do play this for going first but you really need to see the media dragon underneath otherwise there's no point in it can we just once again come back to the fact that this tamayas is level eight not seven hate crime absolute absolutely disgusting konami and yes i know they were trying to make it match the level of the freaking original tamayas knight card i don't care it's stupid they shouldn't have done that that's really dumb anyway back to this card this card is pretty bad without a dragon underneath with a dragon underneath not so bad but without the dragon yeah it's pretty big yikes so i'm uh, i'm gonna just cut it but it's not the worst titanic moth this is a card i kind of love because it's just like another mothra card and it looks cool uh so you have no other monsters i can attack directly Directly, but when doing so the battle damage is half. Okay, sure. So it can win in time, right? So that's cool uh, When this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent detach a material from this card inflict 500 your opponent for each card in hand So even more win in time <laughs> Sadly, you have to go to battle phase to make it do both of like the effect and the damage So it's kind of like it would have been nice if you could just do the burn effect without having to go battle phase because this would be a great time in the round rank 7 of course we do have flare metal for time in the round rank 7 so it's not the biggest deal. But yeah, it was a cool idea. I just think car other cards do its job better. All right, here we are at a card I absolutely hate. The amount of people who think this card is good, like, feel keep feeling free to prove me wrong. But let's talk about this card. First, it needs two level seven spellcasters. So that's a bit janky because we're going to really do it with Chronicle and we need to talk about Chronicle still. Our uh, Chronicle and Magician Soul Summoning DM. But let's just assume that's easy to, to fulfill. So while this card has Xe material, you can use quick play spells and traps from your hand on your opponent's turn by detaching one material from this card at activation. That would be a good effect if we could fill our board with spells and traps set and our hand also had spells and traps still to go. We are not Sky Striker or a consistent deck that can do that. So I'm not sure what this card is meant to do. I understand if your spells and traps are in your hand, they can't be destroyed so they're safer. Guess what? If they destroy this card or if they pop it with like Regeki, Lightning Storms, anything Pankratops, yeah, it floats. But what are you doing? All your spells and traps are in your hand <laughs> and now you can't use them because they outed your bolt your ebon high like i don't understand the design philosophy around this card it makes zero sense so if this xz summon card is destroyed by battle or, or sent and sent to the grave oh it's only by oh no or if this xz card is sent to the graveyard by opponent's card effect thank god thank god it says that you can special summon a dark spellcaster from hand or deck then destroy a card on the field that's a pretty good effect if the first effect was good it would be like a nice secondary effect but that's the whole effect of the card at this point and what are you going to keep in your hand in this deck like i know i'm not playing solemn judgments and stuff and i should like a lot of people say oh you meant to play dm with that sure whatever you would play a build that played more quick play spells and trap cards right it doesn't specify what kind of trap so you definitely play like judgments and strikes and stuff right with this once again they out this and all the cards are in your hand and you lose like i don't get it here's what i think instead of making two monsters into a rank seven that says you can use your hand like as quick effects on your opponent's turn instead of doing that make a rank seven that's relevant i'd even say make flare metal and just fucking set your hand for god's sake <laughs> set the other three cards in your hand and pass damn turn if they out the flare metal oh well they'll probably burn on the way there and then you flip your back rows and stuff and you're fine if they're Lightning Storm you, boo-hoo. You go next game or you flip Judgment, one of the two. I just don't understand what Ebon High was trying to achieve. The floating effect, once again, is not the problem. It's a pretty good effect. It's the first effect and it baits people into thinking it's good. And let's talk about the stats. They went, okay, Ebon Illusion Magician was like an aggressive going second, attacking uh, Dark Magician. Let's make Ebon High like a defensive, chill, stally Dark Magician that floats. It sounds good on paper. But the way they went about it is just so bad. 2800 defense, okay. 2300 attack, what? <laughs> like, 
turning two level sevens into a monster with 2300 attack, that effect better be broken because those stats aren't quite what I need. And yeah, I know going first you'd play in defense with 2800 defense. It's not that impressive considering the rest of the effects are just not that great. Like to some degree you want it to get outed because you want to do the floating into something that's maybe DM from deck if you have circle up or just some other dark spellcaster in your deck that's oppressive. So you kind of want it to die. And the other aspect of that is you don't if you keep all your spell traps in your hand if you didn't set them. Like, can anyone tell me what the fuck this card's meant to do? It just baffles me. It just makes me think Konami just doesn't understand Yu-Gi-Oh. Even when they made this card back in like 2012 or whatever. Like, the deck did not need this. We needed something, it wasn't this. And if you tell me this isn't a Dark Magician card, you're lying. It basically is. We spoke about uh, Galaxy Tomahawk. If it comes back, you play it. It's very straightforward. Card's good. This is a cool archetype to look forward to. I'm not going to try to say the name of the archetype, because it's like Kashati Lang. There, I just tried to say it, and then sure. Shangri-La. But anyway, the point is, these cards are like mostly level 7s, and they might have some synergy with DM, but I do just feel like they're going to be better on their own. But there's one of them that I really like the synergy with DM with, and maybe I'll talk about him. All right, here he is. It's the Unicorn. So, Kishatri-La Unicorn. Now, Unicorn has the same stats as Dark Magician. <gasps> That's hot. And uh, he also says when you control no monster, special summon this card from hand. So, it's kind of like Tenye Vishuda. And it's even got the stats. And you might notice I'm talking about the stats a lot. Being 25, being 25, uh, and DM being 25. And that's because Chronicle Magician, while I think you just play one, maybe two's kind of pushing it. I'd say just one, because it's highly searchable with Illusion of Chaos Prep and all that jazz. Uh, but the point is, if a monster with 2500 attack or defense is summoned, you can summon him. Like, you special him, right? As a chain, that's cool. It's not the best effect, and when he's summoned, he can target something and boost it by 25, which is very big. And actually, he gives us some OTKs, which is very nice. Uh, I've shown them off in previous vids. If you haven't seen them, go check out my Rank 7 vids. But the biggest weird thing about Chronicle is it needs to be the original attack or defense of 25. So it is nice when our support cards like the shooter and uh, like Unicorn guy here, just helping us to fulfill those requirements, you know, consistency, it's always good. Obviously, if you have prep, you've got Illusion of Chaos, you've got Magician Souls, you've got DM. It's a four-card thing to get to DM, which, of course, lets Chronicle summon itself. But remember, Chronicle summons in defense, because why would Konami want us to have a card that can be aggressive and summon in attack? Now, the main thing people have pointed out is you want to summon your DM off Souls, your Chronicle, and then one of your other level 7s, however you can, and then just overlay the Chronicle with that other rank 7, so you keep the DM on the 5k, the big beefy DM. Uh, and then you can swing them in for game kind of thing, right? Because most a 5k DM and most of these will be game, hopefully. Anyway, we haven't spoken about Unicorn properly. So Unicorn says, during the main phase, add one of his archetype spell from deck to hand. Just can we get that on a Dark Magician? That would be great. Just su summon it for free, search a card. <laughs> when are we getting something like this, Konami? <laughs> God damn it. Uh, there's more, though. Can you believe it? So, when this card declares an attack or if your opponent activates a monster effect, look at the opponent's extra deck and banish a monster from it. What? What do you mean this thing has three effects and summons itself for free? This card is insane. Now, once again, it's probably going to be better played with its actual archetype, and I'm not saying that it's going to be better with DM. I'm just saying, this is a good card. We can play it. We might. It looks cool too. It's got a cool art. It's very red. I like red. Now let's also point out, this one summons itself for free too, it just doesn't have the DM stats. But, however, it does say during the main phase, add one of the archetypes monsters to hand, which means you could just add this one, which is pretty cool. When this one attacks, or when your opponent's monster effects activated, target a face-up card your opponent controls, banish it face down. Wow, another fantastic card. And let's read the Ogre. So the Ogre's also a level 7. Uh, it's got more stats than the others, so not meeting the Chronicle requirement, but that's okay. Uh, specials itself from hand. During the main phase, add one of the traps from deck to hand. Uh, when this card declares an attack or if your opponent activates an effect, excavate top five of your opponents and banish one of them face down. Place the rest on top of the deck in, hand in the same order. Interesting effect. Interesting effect. I still think the Unicorn and the uh, Fenrir are the better of the two, or of the three here. Uh, and the Xyz is very interesting. We won't talk about that. It, the only thing is they're Earth, Wind, and Water. So that doesn't really go with our kind of Allure of Darkness theme. But hey, maybe chucking in one of these will be absolutely fine, right? Maybe instead of a Flare, one of the Meteors, you play one of these. Maybe instead of one of the Shooters, you just play one of these. Like, it's just about being able to summon even more cards, right? 
Now, of course, this one does suffer from the problem of you have to control no monsters to summon it, and the shooter needs no effect monsters. So you can see they kind of contradict each other, but you can pick whichever one and maybe just play one of them. That's totally up to you. I don't really care. Media Dragon and Magician Souls, they don't care what's on the field, so you can always do them last and just get your Vashuda out or your weird Unicorn Brother uh, first. And of course, Chronicle needs something else to summon anyway, so he's just sitting in the hand till later anyway. So it's good that Chronicle, Souls, and Media can all wait till later while the shooter can open and Unicorn can open kind of thing. Not bad. Hopefully we get some cooler Rank 7s down the track. You think we'd have a really nice one by now, because Rank 8s, they're all kind of nice. We don't really have anything of an equivalent in Rank 7s, but that's okay. I think that covers just about everything I want to talk about in terms of Rank 7 Dark Magician. It's weird because Rank 7s in this deck, they all want to go second more or less, but DM as a deck concept wants to go first, so it's a bit of contradiction. The Media Dragon wants you to play Ref, you don't have to, but it's nice. And of course, the shooter needs non-effects, and this unicorn guy, he seems pretty cool. Chronicle is a, a very mid card, you really only want to play one of it, I feel, as well. But it might be okay in the standard DM builds at 1 as well, I'm not really too sure on it, I think you'd rather just play Apprentice at this point at 1. But the point is, in an XZ build, you definitely go and play Chronicle. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the XZ uh, engine discussion. 